Football Show on Off The Ball. With Sky, all the football you love in one place across Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports. This is News Talk. I'm prepared to edit my cap. Do it then. Do it then. What about your start to the game? I was, it wasn't bad, was it? <laughs> Why should it be an honest answer be a mistake? How can a modern day manager not have a mobile phone? Why should he? Oh. You're welcome along. Football show is upon us. Tom McDonald of the Irish Independent is here in the studio. You're very welcome. Thank you, Joe. Dan wearing shorts, everybody. Yeah, feeling feeling sort of a bit of a summery vibe. Although it wasn't actually as warm as I was expecting. What is the etiquette in shorts in the office for a man? Well those hairy legs. <laughs> well what like what what would your policy be? Uh, do you have like a, tra- a temperature threshold? It's like twenty-five plus it's acceptable. I don't have a policy. I don't think. I like. You know. I think there is a. I mean, there are Irish people who will wear shorts at any opportunity. That's definitely become more of a thing now. Mm-hmm. Like it could be like ten degrees and you're wearing shorts. Whereas, in my defence, playing a bit of seven or astro today. God, he's sweaty as well. He yeah. hasn't showered. But no, it's just like after that, it's like you're not going to get into like because it was meant to be a bit warmer than it actually is. Okay. Well, and I'm, I'm I'm comfortable. Yeah, I'm comfortable in my skin, Joe. Okay, good, 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 yeah. good. I thought it was a statement but um, I didn't yeah. think it was a statement it was just more, <laughs> it was just more, more laziness really as much as anything you know we have um, rubber stamped I think at this stage our goodbye to the Premier League season that was with Gav Cooney and last night and Pat Nevin on the uh, football show on Monday so FA Cup final is taking centre stage it is a Manchester derby for the first time in the history of the competition which is quite something yeah final. that is mad actually but then I suppose yeah, you have these glitches like that happen. Like for example, a home here. Like I mean, it's, it's much smaller league and smaller. I don't think Bows and Rovers have played in a cup final, or they have maybe back in the twenties or thirties. And you think, how the hell has that happened? The Pats and Bows a couple of years back had never played in a cup final, and like, the league is so small. You think, surely this would have happened. And I know England is obviously much bigger, more clubs, but it's and Man City have been yeah. in the doldrums, but it's slightly unusual it doesn't happen Everton and Liverpool had a couple of goals at it in the 80s mm. you know so mm. there are narratives uh, plenty to use that great word uh, so City hoping to emulate Manchester United's 99 treble and the 2023 version of Manchester United with a chance to ruin the party it is a 3 o'clock kickoff very traditional uh, 3 o'clock kickoff for the first time in 12 years that's good yeah, until you read, the reason is that the police said you really need to have an early kickoff here. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. is, I, I wonder was it something to do with trains as well? I think there were issues before with that. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but no, I think it's uh, listen. No harm if there's not an extra three hours spent drinking. Uh, was it was some of the advice apparently? Ah, because I think the Epsom Derby, the racing has started at half one this Saturday as a con- as a consequence of this. Yeah, that is true. So uh, Martial is out for Manchester United, which scuppers Wayne Rooney's plan in the Sunday Times at the weekend. He was very much recommending uh, two banks of four. Don't really budge from your positions, but to have two split strikers who cheat was his uh, phrase. Mm. Uh, basically, it's the Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, uh blueprint they were all his best performances um, Rooney harking back to the days of Duff and Robin and saying those guys sometimes would cheat and it was very distracting when you were trying to attack and you knew that they were just lurking on the half turn uh, behind you so he was saying that's the best way to go about taking on a City so he was saying Rashford and, and Martial who knows how Manchester United will go about their business but um, I guess it's one of those things you make City pretty firm favourites but it's not inconceivable it's not inconceivable. What's your okay? Just to play not devil's advocate, but what's what's the main reason to believe Manchester United will win? One off occasion, a certain pressure comes on treble chasing Manchester City. Mm. The game is still in the mix with twenty minutes to go. Yeah, like United score an early goal, etc. Just becomes one of those games where yeah, the, you start well and you suddenly get into a position and the magic happens yeah I like I mean you can see it you know you, you can see that um, but then like you do have memories of games in recent memory where they've been blown away by Lost. City yeah and it's hard to I just think like City have, have been able to sort of win the league with a couple of games to spare you know it's a week till the Champions League final it's not like you know when it used to be a was it was 99 a cup final on a Saturday and a Champions League final on a Wednesday and sure that type of thing it's what um, poor Nicky Butt was told son yeah. you're my only fit centre midfielder who can play on Wednesday you're not playing today yeah. Skulls and Keane obviously suspended yeah so like it feels like it's nicely balanced in such a way that they're just 
the distraction angle isn't viable yeah. you know that's that's not a runner at all um, and I don't think the pressure angle either I mean if they can handle the pressure of Real Madrid of all teams coming to the Etihad very much in the mix uh, all the pressure that goes with that Champions League situation I think they can handle this I think. Well, I, I do think there's going to be pressure on the Inter Milan game the Champions League I think that's their only enemy in that match is this, the symbolism of winning the Champions League that sort of mental block like that is a game where Inter Milan definitely I know we're jumping ahead yeah. but like, that is a game where it is the classic just stay in the game yeah. just stay in the game because you can you know you can sort of play tricks on their mind if you can sort of maintain that this one but I think this is the thing like okay they want to win the travel sure but it and, and I'm not saying it's not to be all and end all either but I feel like it's just it's a it's a good occasion for yeah. City no you know? I know what you mean it's really interesting two games so you'd say on balance they're definitely better than both of their opponents they're accustomed to handle the pressure it's just it's two games where opponents who are pretty high level are going to dig in in a very committed defensive way and make this tough for you and over 180 minutes across the two games that gets a bit sticky like I don't think Manchester United are going to come out and play ball or take any risks whatsoever it will be something akin to what Rooney talked about Yeah. and I think Inter will do similar and so when you're City that's oh, we're a bit a, of a grind a breakaway goal here from being behind the eight ball so it's fascinating how it's all laid out gun to my head I think they'll blitz both of them really yeah I feel like they'll they'll win comfortably on Saturday. I do think they'll win the Champions League. I just feel like there's a story in that game. Mm. You know, I just feel it just could be more complicated than than people think. And then like you know, maybe like a lot of this see isn't really football analysis. It's just a hunch. Yeah. You know, based on on a sort of a mental some kind of like the the the, the type of thing we talk about like how, how teams are, are you know battling and like City's history in the Champions League to be fair lends itself to that. You know, like inexplicable defeats at various times. Um, I I just don't know. Like like I suppose there is this debate. I mean, it's probably a general Premier League season review theme like Manchester United came third it's a very good season how good do they need to be to finish third mm. you know like this is the thing you know what is the value of third place in this season where a lot of the teams they finished ahead of that they were behind last year were like all over the shop yeah you know, like what, like, and I don't know the answer to that question. Like, I mean, they ha- they obviously had periods of the season where they looked very good, yeah. sort of tailed off a little bit towards the end, you know, the European sort of exit. And you're sort of looking at it now, going, I mean, yeah, like, okay, I mean, the, you know, Liverpool had a bit of a run, Newcastle, no one expected them to be ready this year. Spurs were a joke, Chelsea were a joke. Mm. I mean, Brighton, like, Brighton really could have had a run at the top four if they'd almost been, you know, they had this bad backlog of games and they had a couple of crazy results, as, as mad as that sounds. Brentford aren't too far off it. Yeah. You're sort of thinking, yeah, they've turned the corner and there is a belief, but, like, there is, the, I mean, that just leads you to the impression that, I mean, when it came down to it, Man City blew away Arsenal and, like, why wouldn't they do it no. in this game here? They're ruthless. Uh, Pep Guardiola winning the LMA Manager of the Year award for the third time during the week. Ferguson on stage, Gareth Sekid on stage, Pep over in Barcelona. Guys, I can't turn up. I can't turn up every year for this, so he accepted it that way. It was kind of interesting when, with Ferguson next to him, I thought, because remember the debate was raging about a month ago, who's had the more profound effect on football? Mm. Was Ferguson an innovator in the way Guardiola is? Maybe not. And it was interesting, Kelly Cates was interviewing South Kate on stage next to Ferguson, and she was asking him about the effect Guardiola's had on English football or the English players he's managing. And he was talking about how Oh, you know, and he's right next to Ferguson for this. Like, he was saying, the dads in this country, I'm sure the mums as well, he meant, but the dads in the country, the coaches of underage football, they were all watching Pep's Barcelona 10 years ago in brackets when they were hockeying Alex's Manchester United. Yeah. But they were watching that team, and so they saw that this is the way football should be played, and so it's infiltrated down to underage like over a decade ago, and that's why we have the players we have now in a sense, which was a really interesting comment that even Southgate is looking at the technicians in English football now, and I'm sure structures are a big part of it, but he reckons even the weekend warrior dads who are coaching the under-8s we're watching Barcelona hammering Manchester United in Champions League finals and saying, let's play more like them. Yeah, there is. A, yeah, there is. There is something. That, I mean, there's like a broader debate here, and I don't. Like, I, I think I don't have the evidence to sort of talk about it. But 
but anecdotally from speaking to people involved in the game that I think there's probably be an, an impact on the type of players that are being produced as well too the little lad the little technicians yeah and that's why someone like Evan Ferguson is like a really big deal in England because they look at an old school number nine like in some ways and he's not quite old school but there's not a huge amount of them and like even look at the centre halves in the England team that's why Harry Maguire endures you know and and like there's that's even there's a debate here at home around that that like we have a certain stereotype of the Irish players but even that under 17 team that are away a lot of the exciting players are the front players yeah. you know and there's no doubt that the way like teams are being coached and playing the game and the you know the the style of player um, you know the, bit of the tactical stuff the false nines and, and various sort of uh the tactical innovation is like there's, there's, it feels like there's a production line of a lot of similar type of players and, and not in some other departments of a certain quality yeah, but look at, maybe you need a longer sample size over like a longer period of time yeah. um, but people will say sometimes that the Premier League Academy system um, is amazing um, but there's there's a debate around that actually like clearly it's de- like because there's so much money it's developing some great players like Foden and people like that but is it actually fully efficient in terms of maximum output there's, there's conflicting views on that well I think the famous line was that Diego Simeone blames Guardiola for the lack of Diego Costas available mm. which is um, yeah. a line from a couple of years ago I'll be honest with Dan I know we were thinking the same thing if only Wes was coming through 10 years ago oh, be God. a different story in yeah. his career it really is I mean there's going to be a lot of I, like, I mean, I, sometimes you just won't say things to, to that they age well in the future but like there's going to be a lot of excitement I think about Andrew Moore who plays for Brighton in the next couple of years um, who is um, a young kid but one Premier League appearance this year now he might go on loan next year but they've given him a four year deal but I remember speaking to someone in Brighton a couple of years ago about Andrew Moore and there's, there's a shade of Wes but they said he's almost more Spanish than Irish in terms of his style in terms of how he plays um, I remember watching him in the friendly pre-season friendly for Bray Wanderers a couple of years ago it's kind of mad pre, pre-COVID and then with the lockdown he just ended up going straight to England rather than playing that season at home here and was like 15-16 but I'm just telling you just just wait give it a couple of years that's who you're going to be talking about in that in that position I'm okay with Definitely. that but Wes no Wes who just retired like under the radar completely yeah. just slipped away but it is true if you come along now a lot of teams at underage level now in Ireland if you watch them they have a, a Wes type operator yeah interesting uh, case this week just to note uh, the specifics of which are important to varying degrees but um, five men have been sentenced to a combined 30 years very much not 30 years each but still 30 divided by five men is on average six years in prison mm. which is not nothing to say the very least and this is after the Premier League brought about a historic private prosecution to clamp down on the illegal streaming of matches so in the mail online for instance there, there's photos of rather glum looking perpetrators sitting on his couch and then pictures of the what looked like 15 black little boxes with wires everywhere as he was um, uh, beaming out uh, football matches and sport to uh, subscribers. This is the really interesting thing about illegal streaming is that people are also paying subscriptions to illegal channels. It's not, you know, a lot like I know people in my world like that who are paying. Oh, yeah. I, I pay a subscription to an illegal um, yeah. broadcaster so um, fans using TV sticks to illegally stream Premier League matches uh, very unlikely to face prosecution was the uh, line from authorities so of these five gentlemen their income came through three uh, streaming organisations which offered illegal access to content including live Premier League matches uh, so they generated £7 million pounds between 16 and 21 Hmm. So if you think, oh, no wonder these streaming sites, are they getting by at all? Seven million generated between 16 and 21, which is quite something. And apparently um, in the UK, a thousand individuals received letters in effect saying, please stop using these streams, but uh, nobody likely to be uh, prosecuted. So that was an interesting case from the UK. They're going after them. I I, I don't know how hopeless they're... Um, cause is I'm not sure how many of these sites there are I'm not terribly au fait with this world but it did strike me as a pretty interesting case definitely historic and it was very much Premier League driven well I think 
I suppose when you think about it, right, like anecdotally, you hear so many people, and this isn't a classic, I don't, like I don't, you hear people talking about their dodgy box and their various things, but like I'm maybe too old school in that regard. Like I don't know if a dodgy box is something you're paying for routinely or monthly, or you just pay up front for your dodgy box and then... Hey presto! I've I've heard different versions from people, but like, what do you do? Well, I I I I like recording stuff. Although then I, I mentioned it to someone the other day, they were like, "Oh, I, I record on my uh, service." I was like, "Really?" Okay. <laughs> but uh, I I like I record lots of stuff, so I just it would, for me that was never uh, an attraction or whatever. So that's that be my perspective on it. But like what you do you do understand that like you know I mean if you want to watch all the games I mean, this is one of the things about the TV deal and in the UK and here like that you do like to, to watch all the Premier League games like there's a lot of various subscriptions you have to you have to sort of plug into um, and people always think about like you look how, how football um, is funded like TV writes money and like, that's why you like you even have the, the Saudi and the Qatar stuff and the various issues in, in that world as well and there's also the piracy issues and you know you, you will see at the weekend you'll see a goal a clip is put up on social media and you maybe watch it and then it's gone within half an hour mm. you know because it's, it's obviously a breach of copyright and people spend their whole time chasing up this but I suppose people the, the natural there's, there's a legal aspect to it but behind it all there's an element of football going well, we don't want to lose the value of our, of our TV rights here you know this is what this is what keeps the game going round but like it does feel like that horse is bolted spectacularly yeah sort of like protest pro, you know prosecuting people for jaywalking I mean technically like you know technically within your rights to do so but you just know you're going to spend your you're going to waste a lot of police time going after this issue yes um but it is I mean you see this issues at times as well where like you hear the again the trails of the pub showing games illegally at three o'clock and you know they have to be gone after and it's like does if you went down this road seriously you'd have to d- d- devote an entire the entire resources of a department to chasing this and to what end well Premier League might say we'll do it we'll fund it mm. I don't know were your ears uh, burning on Sunday afternoon Dan around half two because the pay-per-view were discussing your piece in the Sunday Independent uh, you did I, to be fair lots of people have uh, done it over the last couple of days a quick recap on Irish players in the Premier League and you said that um Needless to say, Evan Ferguson, he is yeah. uh, very much the cherry on top of what is a charred cake, was your line. So only 12 players have qu- crossed the white line for a Premier League game this term. And of those 12 players, half made just a single figure number of appearances. Two have left since permanently. Another two spent the second half of the year on loan. As you said in your piece, to compare with the 90s or early 2000s is just such a different stratosphere. Yeah, the Premier time. League is now a different beast. But the interesting comparison, perhaps, is a decade ago, consistently around 25 players, and that has dropped to half that number now, to give people your uh, ranking. And you got a bit squeamish about ranking when we got past number one, I think. <laughs> well, can I just say one thing to stop yeah. you? It was printed on Sunday afternoon. Cuevin Kelleher then played to become the 13th Irish player this year because he hadn't played at the time of publication in the Premier League that year so I don't know where he goes in be honest, live Dan, it doesn't transform the picture it doesn't no he goes in in the one appearance club with okay. several others come on go, go for it Evan Ferguson we can gloss over that beautiful 18 appearances and uh, more to follow next year uh, number two of the success stories in Ireland Seamus Coleman 23 appearances I had no problem with that whatsoever because I felt he got an injury free run and he was back in very good form so I think you chalk that up as God Seamus Coleman really showed he can still no, he did. do he it did. then it starts to get a bit oh god there's healthy caveats and all these stories number three Nathan Collins now if we were talking in January Nathan Collins may well have been number one um, but Julian Lopetegui came in yeah. he said Craig Dawson you're my guy and so in effect up until maybe the last um, week or two of the season Collins has pretty much met an abrupt end to yeah he played the last two games team. he did play the last two games which is which is the end there is an encouraging end to that okay yeah. well, do you, so I suspect he'll stay for sure for another season oh well, 100% uh, yeah like the one thing that you're guaranteed in the Premier League is you'll be sacked soon manager I just have to stick this out for a year or two and then maybe my face fits again if oh I wouldn't be worried about Collins at all I actually wouldn't have, I'd have under no, Lopetegui uh, no 
I wouldn't be worried. Break back in? I think I think Lopetegui came in with a firefighting mission okay. to stay up. Um, I think there would be a view that Collins, like he's a record signing, he's the long-term guy. Yeah. Um, some speculation even around Kilman, who's the left-sided defender. Might he go? I don't even know if that's going to happen or not. Um, but he's an investment by the club. I just think Collins, like he played a lot of football, he it just had these uh, concentration issues in games, or like there's a mistake lurking. Yeah, but on paper, like he's one of these where, like he's like he's been a, not a high player, but the football people from the age of like 17, 18, like this guy's a player. They can all see it. I think people who train with him all see it. It's just about ironing that out. Yeah. But I suspect the full preseason at Wolves. I I'm actually not concerned about him at all. Okay, I have to say. Number four. This is an interesting case to discuss. Gavin Bazunu. 32 appearances in a side uh, firmly relegated and he conceded a lot of goals and was put out of the team Mm. as the season went on and yet what invaluable experience for a 21 year old in the Premier League so 32 appearances very tough season Jamie Carragher certainly blamed him and pointed to XG and he is conceding more goals than he should that may well be a valid criticism I don't know but uh, how will we remember this uh, season in Gavin Bazuna's career do you think in five years character building well I, I mean like to see the obvious answer to that is we'll see where he is in five years and that will shape our conclusion yeah, like okay. we, if he's thriving like well that was the making of him and if, you, if for some reason he doesn't come back is, is the Premier League so ruthless that they take a glance at that Carragher big voice in the world of football and maybe it's very damaging for Brazil. I don't think so okay. either. And, I, and you know, I might kind of, I'm giving back to back like positive Irish answers here. Yes, and I'm very. Your piece grimmed me out in this conversation. Yeah, no, I'm, this, I sound like now I'm just like, yes, on this player. No, no, it's not as bad as it may seem. But I think there's parallels probably between Collins and Bazunu in the sense that, like, why do people keep picking Bazunu? Like, I think everyone can see the potential, the ability. He's got a great character. Um, I feel like, like, I feel like when Aaron Connolly came along, there was a real mixed views about Aaron Connolly because you'd, you'd hear the vibes of, I'm not sure if this fella's going to last the course, you know, and unfortunately, so it proved you know he's dropped off the map completely yeah. and there's one or two other players have come along with these concerns about I don't think anyone would have those concerns about Collins or wouldn't have those concerns about Bazunu. I think in terms of training ground and his mentality and his attitude and I think the raw materials like for all for all the the issues around Bazunu, mm. I never felt w- once alarmed when Ireland played France about Bazunu's presence you know um, so I, I'd be in, now uh, will he go down to the championship and play a full season the next year with a team that's winning games as opposed to losing them most weeks could that be great for him I mean obviously he needs to be in the team at the start of the season but I feel like he'll be, he will be okay I, I think he'll be okay either way um, and it's, the, the, it's not really the, I mean that's my opinion but I may be going a little bit more off the opinion of football people who, who can see because you do have these players you wonder about them at an early stage but generally over the period of time the people with the eye for the talent they'll say it comes I think true that's fair. I think 32 yeah. Premier League games age 21 in a tough sticky situation will prove to be no bad thing where we start to feel bad about your list is after those four mm. like number five the Irish player with the fifth best Premier League season in my opinion well listen Dan you're I've right. done this every year for the last 14, 15 years this ranking at the end of every season so I always do it You're a top dog so I mean in your opinion carries weight Oh yeah yeah Number that's, five that's, that's my view yeah yeah. Is Matt Doherty Give me the counterpoint <laughs> Oh I don't have one <laughs> yeah. but I just thought oh god are we well, at Doherty he did, he did like he did play prior to Christmas prior to prior to, be, prior to like, being ch- turfed out the door when Spurs realised oh no he, crap you know loan rules and all this we just need to get rid of Matt yeah. like he was trusted to play in high enough quality Premier League games for Spurs at a certain level like I mean he did score I think he scored a goal in the season I think he did but he definitely like participated in the season you know in games where yeah there was a fair bit at stake and he wasn't getting 10 minutes off the bench at the end have so, we yeah. have we overrated Matt Doherty in this country um, 
Well, it depends when you're talking about. I mean, Matt Doherty at Wolves, like, was a really like was one of the form players in the Premier League yeah. in a team that like was perfectly suited to his system. You no, know, look, sorry, don't get me wrong. He was great, but I just I feel and, like and it's not his fault. Has he been hyped up a bit too much? You know, as one of the best right backs in the I, league. I don't know. He's been talked about. I always feel it as a lukewarm attitude towards him in this country. To Do be you? honest, yeah, I think a lot of Ireland fans have been very critical of Matt Doherty at times. Okay. They don't like his sort of his style. Like, the you body know, language can look a touch. Yes, yeah, so I. Uh, uh, I'm in third gear. I don't think he's ever been a real hype player for our like I mean, the Doherty Coleman debate, for example, like should he be picked at various mm. times? It wasn't like yes, there was times when Doherty the pendulum swung towards him. He was in vogue, and people said oh, you have to can't play Coleman, you have to play Doherty. But I don't know. I don't feel like it, it was. It's ever been ridiculously over the top. Okay. I, I, I'm st- I stand open to correction. What on that. does his future hold then? Uh, I would imagine he'll be playing in the Premier League next year again. With a with a middle to lower tier Premier League side, that would be my. I've heard a bit of you know chat about that, but not something you would commit to print. Um, but I think like his Atletico move has been odd. I, I was wrong about that. I'll definitely say that. Like I, I thought he would play more. I thought yes. that it did appear. How, like, how much has he played now? Oh, like he's he two sub appearances. It's been a disaster, really. Okay, so but it's been a pure Mendes. Would he be play. number one in your La Liga Republic? Oh, well, he's, he, well, yeah, the the, 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 the fella Gattafi, I don't think played this year. Um, yeah, no, I like, that has been a disaster. I, I was wrong about that. Like, just on a, I was way too optimistic about that. I mean, that was clearly by I did probably twig that it was clearly a Mendes play because he is represented by Jorge yeah. Mendes' company, and it's like just two clubs that he has a relationship with. And at the last minute, there was a little bit of uh oh, Spurs have hit their quota. We need to get Pedro Paro in. What what can we do with Matt and they've done a deal and that's what's happened but they do have Molina the World Cup winning right back there um, and maybe if he got injured or something it would have worked out great but uh, I have to admit now I, I don't want to read my piece about Doherty going there initially I might dig it out I wasn't the saying analysis. this is a wonderful moment in his career it was more saying it could work out I, it. well I don't think it was I, people were sort of laughing at the concept it was like no well, Matt Doherty playing for it like, isn't unreasonable like he's played for Spurs in the top six mm. he's entitled to go there it just seems like uh, the manager that was there may not have particularly wanted him yeah which is an issue I don't know what's going on behind the scenes why several successful managers at Spurs and I guess you've got to include it let it go now I've just not been bowled over but I, I do certainly feel at Wolves he was a player who was really benefiting from just that run of games and he's never had that since from the move to Spurs and I just don't feel he's on top of the ground as much or as sharp looking I think he's always looking like a player to me who God if he got another 10 games into him he could really kick on I feel like that's been the story of his time since he moved to Spurs I I dare say if he was super honest with himself and I must just say have I been as sharp have I been as as as, as fit as I've been as I was at Wolves I I just don't see it and even in his Irish performances it's unfair to like pick one moment but I do think of like the way he threw a leg out at Hamden mm. against Scotland and I just like that that just speaks to someone who's not playing week in week out and, and in the uh, full of their fitness I suppose that's, yeah, I that's see what your I point. feel he is I see your point I said Conte sort of came around to him eventually though like he actually did and then but then it just all happened so quickly about needing to get the Pedro Parra thing well, he in said, he said something interesting like he said the player from either a year or two ago is back yeah which but that I mean the other side of that coin is what's been going on for the last year or two yeah well he had I mean Conte had these legendary pre-seasons like when you think about it now you know, uh, sort of uh, tweets that didn't precede great events. Like, remember the great hype over the the Spurs players in Korea doing a mad preseason? They were vomiting. You know, and people wretched. vomiting, like you know, like the early stages of saving, saving Private Ryan or something. Yeah. Like bodies everywhere. People, are like, yes, that's what we want. You know, they're really come good at the end of the longest. Yeah, of all time. <laughs> and, then, and then like at the end of the longest, the Spurs players are mentally shot in mid table. But like we, we all had it in our head, this is great. You know, and Troy Parrott was apparently doing well in these runs. You know, and uh, so a lot of that. Is just pre-season guff okay. but look but anyway Doherty fifth yeah definitely a top I mean what you needed to do to be top five sort of uh, six seven years ago like I was looking back even in recent memory like 2020 I, I did include like the, the previous five years like in 2020 there was 13 different Irish goal scorers in the Premier League out of 21 players who played now that was like um, that was sort of uh, bloated a bit because we had Sheffield United where you had McGoldrick's 
Stevens, uh, Egan. I mean, Horan was even there. Someone else at the time, and you know, we had Burnley and we had West Brom. Mm. We had like some clubs were inflating our quota. Um, but anyway, uh, that's not so much now. Yeah, not the case. By the way, just to stress, I'm a big Matt Doherty fan, and when he's playing well, technically brilliant one of the great sides in Irish jersey is him cutting in from the right I'm side massive. I am a big fan like he had so yeah. much when he does that and he got a yeah. real nose for getting involved as right back so I really hope to see him back he's still only 31 going on two, so there could really be four or five great years left in him yeah so that's right yeah, next totally move is important mightn't be the worst thing in the world if as you say he goes to a Premier League team where he gets regular football and then uh, he's in good shape let me just read through the remaining yeah. Seven, <laughs> and you pick out whichever one or two you want to comment on briefly because the clock is against us. So Mark Travers was number six with eleven appearances. He got twelve then on Sunday. Yeah, unex- oh, uh, does that put him past Matt Doherty? I no, um, okay. he did all right on Sunday actually in the Everton Bournemouth game. But anyway, keep going. Sorry, Gary O'Neill effectively relegated him to reserve status. Joe Hodgett Wolves five appearances hasn't been on the pitch since January got five minutes on Sunday against Arsenal okay. the there pi- we go this I mean the news cycle moves fast Joe <laughs> it just moves so fast uh, number eight Andrew Moore who you mentioned it. I think you, I think that will age well yeah one appearance you do say in your piece is one appearance 12 minutes off the bench against Everton in January will age well but that is number eight I mean from yeah. an Irish oh, I know. point yeah. of view it's not great Tom Cannon at Everton two appearances got his chance off the bench in November and December did great on loan at Preston what happens now Everton have stayed up we'll see ok number 10 Shane Duffy five appearances this is one of the disappointments of the season I think it's fair to say people were encouraged by his move to Fulham and it has not worked out uh, what jumps off the page is off his five appearances four of them were off the bench in the last minute of the game oh, sp- that yeah. is insulting bizarre bizarre I think he went there people thought there was the, the centre halves from the championship come up uh, and he was meant to be sort of third in line wait for your chance then he signed another player and very bizarre very Bang. odd move yeah. now be interesting to know like behind the scenes football's a a pragmatic world maybe he's on a good uh, appearance bonus uh, situation and the manager's like listen you're an experienced pro I respect what you're doing I'll get you an extra four uh, appearances off the bench I don't know if that that is the most optimistic interpretation of a situation I've come up with mm. that sounds like a there's a minute left let's make a sub to waste time yeah Shane then you come well it's, it's, it's probably a minute left we're under pressure we need to defend some corners who's going to defend the box well okay. if you're going to be under siege in the last minute that's where you would see it still though I mean it's not great it's like it's extreme special teams <laughs> you know like field goal player <laughs> sort of looks going to defend a couple of corners uh, number 11 then is Conor Coventry one appearance and number 12 is Conor Ronan at Wolves who's now gone to the MLS so yeah one Conor appearance. Coventry okay. played Conor Coventry did play a lot of conference league games for West Ham went on loan yeah five years time when you're writing this piece how many are on the shortest? Yeah, it's possible that like that twelve thirteen could become the norm. You know, like it's it is. He's, now, the only thing I would say I, is I that I would take twelve thirteen now. If but, there, but with a few more getting. But there's other years. Appearance. There's other years we've had low enough numbers, but it's just the majority of like met a double figure number of appearances. I think that's the thing this year. It's not so much the, the volume, although it is the lowest ever. It's it's how many of them didn't play that much. Like there was fifteen last year. Yeah. I think fifteen last year, but like a greater number had a more meaningful season. Well, you're basically saying so, Mark Travers fair enough 11 appearances but like Hodge 5 Andrew Moran 1 Tom Cannon 2 Shane Duffy 5 for them in the last minute Connor Coventry and Connor Ronan 1 like it's not really part of the Premier League no no you're right I mean like next year John Egan will be part of the Premier League and the Stevens hopefully will see like he hasn't played as much this year with injury Josh Josh Cullen 100% will be that's a big move for him isn't it yeah Yeah, and Obafemi his move is meant to go through and he'll be around Burnley so you can see that happening I mean Andrew Moore actually might go on loan so we'll see will Kelleher if Kelleher because he would go in there somewhere will he go somewhere permanently and suddenly play more and then you're getting up to like 7-8 that are around the place we'll see what happens with Seamus Coleman um, like, Collins will be there for a while Pazino obviously drops down yeah. um, Josh Cullen playing Darty be back 30 matches as Burnley's uh, reigning player of the season like that's worth 20 lads playing a minute yeah realistically in terms of how we feel about Irish presence in the Premier League yeah the one thing that you would say is that if you're talking about Irish football at the moment mm-hmm. like there's a lot there, the most exciting players coming up are all in the younger age bracket like someone like Andrew Mamba Bedele yeah. been linked with some 
big clubs like will he play in the Premier League in the future I think he will whether Norwich get there or not I wouldn't give up on Adam Eda either no. you know so like there's and there's others Jason Knight like there, there are players capable of getting there but there probably is a rump on them that need to get promoted with their club yeah. like Josh Cullen has John you know? O'Shea at our uh, road show at the Mansion House and he won't mind me saying it because you know complimentary but he, he was saying off air Adam Eda we still really like him yeah. you know 10 month injury has not helped but there's real quality there so uh, I feel a bit better about your piece now I think I hope I hope not much better be <laughs> marginally better, better. Yeah, yeah we'll take a short break I want to talk to you about uh, League of Ireland as well our football show coverage is brought to you by Sky proud partner and supporter of the Republic of Ireland women's national football team back in one sec Football on Off The Ball With Sky Proud partner and supporter of the Republic of Ireland Women's National Football Team This is News Talk Football on Off The Ball With Sky All the football you love in one place Across Sky Sports, BT Sport and Premier Sports This is News Talk Welcome back, Joe Malloy here Almost forgot my name, it's my own name But um, there you go Damn. You're new to the gig, you know. <laughs> it's gonna go a chance. Jeez. It's like those Premier League lads. Just use kids getting in for your one appearance here. Well, I wouldn't usually do a welcome back, Joe Malloy here, so it just felt a touch uh, mm. off. Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent here. Thank you. So we are 18 games into the League of Ireland season. Derry on 34 points to Shamrock Rovers, 33 points after uh, 18 games apiece. Two losses in a row for Rovers, most recently a high-profile game for all the wrong reasons away to Cork. Derry also lost away to Sligo, 1-0 in both games. The whole country really um, disgusted at the abuse of Stephen Bradley and his son. What you would say is there are individuals in the world who do crazy things but I think in the main you'd be encouraged by the reaction across the board you'd be very encouraged by Cork City's reaction you'd be encouraged by the fact that uh, two fans have been banned for life and it's been dealt with Mm. at least in a very serious fashion is that a fair thing to say yeah no I think so I mean Cork got ahead of it very quickly like I was at another game last week Pats and the Dock and Steve O'Donnell sort of kept the Dock players in for ages so you know you were just around waiting and uh, shocked that a statement could be produced that quickly but clearly there was no doubt over what had happened here you know they didn't need to have a full inquiry to establish like what had happened you know and that there was a clear you know a clear apology to be made and and swift action was taken um, and is it your understanding that it was the two fans who've been banned or a bigger cohort and just not possible to identify everyone? No, no, I think um, I think it's possible there might have been like a, a smaller, like a, around four people in a group, but okay. no more than that. Okay. And like, I'm not even 100% sure. And there's definitely no suggestion there was like a, a massive crowd of people from which it came. It was a group of around that size. Um, but yeah, I think it was it was clear like the players, the staff were coming out from I think an interview or a warm down, and it, it was heard in such a way that there was no there was no doubt. I think you know I think even I think one of the uh, accused may even have owned up effectively straight away on the night. Okay. So as in there was no sense of disappearing off into a crowd to deny all knowledge. Okay. It wasn't like that. That's worth mentioning. Mm. People do silly things, not least at football matches. Well, yeah. I mean, like this is. I mean, there's a line that's crossed here. And I mean, when you think about it, like you know, I mean, this Stephen Bradley situation, situation like the stuff with his son Josh has just been, I can imagine, incredibly draining for the family, mm. and it's obviously ongoing. But I'm not saying I would be careful how I phrase this, but like you know, th- this was obviously very high profile last year, and there would have been a lot of high profile games that Shamrock Rovers would be involved in with with clubs they have a bad relationship with, you know, and first rivalry, and it's almost like a line that was never crossed. It was almost there was a sense of there's just somewhere that you don't go, and you haven't heard anecdotally of anything like this in certain games or derbies, you know, you wouldn't believe what the fella behind said or whatever. There hasn't been that. Yeah. It's almost been a sense of no, no, no this is a line that you don't cross so there was I think just almost a sense of shock last week that now 
after a game where your team have have lost, so where it's coming from, the team have won. You know, it's not like it's not during a flashpoint incident where there's tensions are inflamed and and so the whole thing is just so out of the blue. I mean, from Cork, it's just they've they've handled it well. Yeah. Um, but for them, I mean, they had a great night as a club, which was ruined by it. You know, and yeah. and I, I think look lifetime bans anyone can argue and we'll see how, how justice runs its course otherwise and what people are comfortable with I suppose in terms of resolving this yeah if for anyone who didn't see I suspect most have at this stage it was notable that Bradley himself very publicly brought this to people's yes. attention and, and made the point I've been in football all my life I take my fair share I get the culture this is a step beyond I'm not accepting it no, you know, yeah, which was good. Yeah, um, two losses in a row. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I mean, it, it obviously naturally and correctly just overshadowed everything. Um, yet behind it all, like on the night, was an absolutely crazy game. Like, I mean, they've lost back to back Shamrock Rovers against Drada at home and Cork City away. Drada and Cork are quite likely, you would think, to be finishing eighth and ninth this year. You know, they're expected to be in that bracket. Um, so, I mean, this Shamrock Rovers side, who recently a couple of people were thinking they couldn't see them losing again this year, their form was that good, yeah. to lose back to back to them. Three, um, three, three players sent off. I mean, that is the story of the, what happened? the football game. So, well, the first one Richie Tell. was Richie Tell. People yeah. might have seen this gun round. He was on the ground, had a sort of a coming together with a Cork player, Gordon Walker. Um, charged to have kicked out with him you look at it and he didn't connect with him you could debate whether there was some kind of intent I don't believe there was but I think you can handle uh, this decision you can't really handle it going against you but you can see where it comes from in a weird way your appeal was rejected yeah it was rejected the, the appeals process on, it, I think the appeals I would presume there would be an element of well I mean if there was some kind of intent there they're not gonna, you're not going to be okay. clear now which terrible denied it was any intent, of course, at all. Um, the weird one was they got two sets of two players, Johnny Kenny and Sean Hoare, both got yellow carded and then sent off within two minutes of their first yellow card. Ooh. The two yellow cards were both for dissent, the first ones, and then two tackles, the second ones, if you know what Usually I mean. Usually when you just get a yellow, you're allowed a free one. Well, that's my issue. That would be my my point here where, where I think Sean McGraw was. There is there is strict letter of the law refereeing and there's a degree of common sense refereeing and like it's been a big discussion point in the league this year about refereeing and it's been pointed out at the World Cup I think it was, was it the, what was the big game reach was a Man City Arsenal there was a number of tackles in the first half of that game that possibly could have been yellows but there's an element of we don't need to put this game on, on ice put everyone on, on tender hooks here but throwing out too many yellows early but in this instance yes you could argue you're on a yellow do you need to go into that tackle but there is almost an understanding of you would think okay one more and you're done and, and when it happens to your team back to back you're going to believe that the world is against you and the two initial yellows for descent are we seeing more yellows for descent across the league this uh, season I think it's I think I just that to me just speaks to like relationships that don't exist between people like I've I've heard and you have to be conscious like I've heard anecdotally that one of them the Johnny Kenny one it seems like he was unlucky you know descent for what was you know just a match incident where you're talking about you're complaining about something I think he was shoved as he was going off the pitch and made a comment to the officials about dealing with this and gets a yellow card for it now look again by letter of law if you use language or if you say something then maybe but again are players not using language at referees yeah all the time throughout again all the time yeah all the time if 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 and this is my point, like you can you can see the argument for all of the red cards from a strict definition of the law point of view, but if that was enforced in every game to that degree, you'd have red cards. To, like games would we'd have four players sent off in games most weeks. And I think that's the issue. It's consistency and communication is the concern. People can accept mistakes, but like when this one, it seems to be like you know relations are such that that common sense doesn't appear to exist and the ref will defend his position on this you know completely he doesn't have this is the thing the referees aren't allowed to speak and come out and give their voice if they wanted to and this is this is why there's always a vacuum with these debates where their word um, you know we, we, we pick them apart and they don't necessarily get to come out and clarify why this happened and that but I'm aware of that yeah. um, but I think you can stand back critically and look at 
some of the instances this year in games and you would think just just appears to be a, a lack of common sense application now I've, I've referenced at the start of the year there's a new analyst uh, analysis tool this year which means decisions are all being looked at very closely and my a, a concern about that would be that an incident frozen in isolation may look like a yellow card but how does that relate to how the game was flowing yeah. at that stage how do you feed it into the algorithm yeah. I just booked yeah. them there's a reality to human emotion yeah um, so a word then on, on what's happening here are, are Rovers going to bounce back nicely and get back on trap or track or is, is something maybe more troublesome ahead well they've got three games before the break so like obviously there's there's games on Friday games on Monday and, and next Friday and they played on Dock on Friday I think they've got four suspensions for that game yeah. um, they've still got a squad to withstand it the bigger issue like Derry had a chance to go four points clear because they played after Rovers they played on Saturday and didn't take it that's mm. got to be a frustration mm. for them um, but yeah there's the quick fire three games before the break we'll see what happens with those either way it's going to be it's going to be very tight after the break Shamrock Rovers play Derry but then you get into July and it's Europe okay. and European focus is going to be big naturally for all the clubs but particularly Rovers and if Derry are close they'll think you've got a chance Bowes Shelburne was on TV not good text in from Jay uh, lads not a hardcore League of Ireland fan but I love Duffer so I had a look Shelburne very poor to watch very defensive men behind the ball is this the norm can you ask Dan sister? well I think Shelburne have conceded I think something like four goals from open play this year I think all the goals they've conceded have been I think seven out of eleven goals were dead balls and early in the season there would have been a criticism of Shells I mean I said it and it was picked up on even people and like Joey O'Brien said at one point it was like you know you're saying we're hard to watch um, but they are very organised it doesn't always lend itself to a classic because we play. played um, Stephen Doyle's interview with Damien Duff a couple of weeks ago and what jumped out to me was Duff in that interview said we work on attacking shape and attacking play all the time now sometimes like look football goes a certain way and sometimes you have to dig in be organised and be hard to beat but it's not the plan yeah I think the, I think what it is is that they are very they're clearly like there's great reports about Damien Duff as a coach yeah. and, their, and the coaching team schooled and, in the Mourinho way. Well, they, well they've got their principles right yeah. like a lot of other teams in the league are very inconsistent they're built all over the place Shells have been very consistent in terms of very hard to beat mm. and there have been signs in recent weeks they won 3-0 away in Sligo where it looked like they were getting the attacking side of the play right now in the last two weeks they've played derbies against uh Pats and Bowes both on TV and they just have looked a little bit oh, just lethargic attacking wise Duff said afterwards maybe they're afraid like maybe we need to allow the players to express themselves more and he was I thought um, in the 2-2 draw at Rovers which was on TV that was great fair they were very good yeah they, they, they showed they were very good on point counter attacking team but I guess Rovers were maybe coming on to them a little bit more okay. and in teams too maybe, cautious teams uh, yeah maybe. just I don't know it, it just it, it, like there's no doubt that they are not a team that you would they would scream out I'm going to see goals in this match you know and the stats back it up but look it happens you know the shells remember like last year in the cup final got completely opened up like by Derry they were picked true, apart true. and I think in response to that they've been a lot more consistent this year but obviously what they've lost is maybe a little bit going forward well, look, these things happen Dan if you listen to our GEA chat in the last hour no one's happy with us oh, I'm, I'm, I'm possession and all this stuff six yeah. minutes of possession yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm following this stuff yeah um, Clock slightly against us. Stephen O'Donnell, you said he kept the Dundalk boys back. It's 11 p.m. Oh, this is like Roy Keane territory. 80 minutes, yeah. 80 minutes in the dressing room and uh, didn't hear any At sort of... At a certain of, point, like, when you get past the hour mark, what, what's left to say? Well, I'd love to, I mean, you'd love to know, like, you said they weren't shouting and bawling and there was no, like, there's no sense of people outside, like, listening with the, you know, glass to the to the wall or something. It was didn't seem like that, um, but it's clear there's something not right there. You're not happy. And they've done it a couple of times. They've had the players, and this obviously oh, is style. Score. So they lost 2-1 to St. Pat's, but I suppose the key point was... Um, it was a weakened St. Pat's side with injuries they had a player sent off in controversial circumstances so it was one all the last with half an hour to go in the game the dog had equalised they were playing against 10 men mm. for the last 30 minutes and O'Donnell's view was just go and win the game you need that killer instinct and in the end they end up losing you know, not even that they didn't the Huffed and Puffett didn't score yeah, they actually lost the game the previous week they were 2 0 up and completely in control and drew 2 all mm. and I think his angle would be they have a lot of players at the club actually like some weeks like 6-7 players from England Scotland come from academies 
who've not played much first team football I think it's more a case of you know how quickly can they become yes. first team winners and but you know there obviously is you can I, I understand the argument like at, at what point of an 80 minute chat you know do you lose the room do you potentially lose the room you know but the judgment of that will be they go to Tala on Friday and if they look like they're on point you would say well maybe maybe that clear the air talk was the turning point of our season master and stroke writes Dan McDonald so like, yeah it's like Gavin Bazzini and Southampton like it was the making of them you know well listen Dan if we can't engage in some scoreboard journalism what's the point what's the point it's what it's all about we are uh, pretty much done our football show coverage as ever brought to you by Sky Proud partner and supporter of the Republic of Ireland women's national football team Dan McDonald of the Irish Independent thank you very much thank you Football on Off The Ball With Sky Proud partner and supporter of the Republic of Ireland Women's National Football Team This is News Talk